So you got to get a 825 out of a thousand, right? Meaning that you got to get 82% of the questions correct. You can take uh, this exam um, online or in person if you like. So you got multiple choice questions, drag and drop, and a couple simulations. So the simulations, actually something is wrong, you have to fix it. It's not going to be question, answer, you pick the best answer, you actually actually have to do something inside of a network, whether that's configuring firewalls, whether that's setting up certain ports, whether that's setting up a switch to be able to go to certain VLANs, so on and so forth. And you got almost two hours to uh, take this exam. So that may sound like a lot of time, but it's not. When you actually get into the actual exam room, that two hours is going to, buy, going to go by super fast. So just make sure that uh, you go by what I tell my guys and my girls. You need to be able to decipher the information in the question and get the correct answer in 60 seconds or less, just to give you a lot more time on those simulations. And just let me know in the comments when you're expected to take the CCNA. And if there's any other uh, training that you guys want me to do, I'd be more than happy to do it. So just let me know. You're configuring OSPF between two routers that are connected via a fast Ethernet interface. Both routers are in area zero and use the correct wildcard mask and router IDs. However, the routers are not forming a neighbor adjacency. After running show IP OSPF interface, you discover that one interface is set to a broadcast network type and the other is point to point. All other OSPF parameters appear correct. What are the routers not establishing? Why are the routers not establishing adjacency? Now, one question you may ask yourself is where the hell did I get these questions from? I got them right from my noggin, right? So all these questions I created myself and I created uh, thousands and thousands of these questions. And you guys can get access to those questions if you hit the last link in the description of this video. So it's a practice test vault and it's thousands and thousands of questions that I hope you pass a certifications like this and many other certifications. So hopefully you guys got OSPF adjacency will fail due to mismatch network types. OSPF requires that neighbors agree on several key parameters, including the network type. If one side is configured as point to point and the other is broadcast, the routers will not recognize each other as valid neighbors. This prevents adjacency from forming even if all other settings are correct. You've been asked to secure access to a switch port that connects to a publicly accessible wall jack. The goal is to prevent users from connecting unauthorized devices or using network splitters to connect multiple devices to one port. You also need to ensure that any violations shut down the port entirely to alert the admin. What port security features should be applied to enforce this type of behavior? Three, two, one. So this one was pretty simple, straightforward. So shutdown. The shutdown violation mode is the strictest setting available in Cisco port security. When enabled, any violation, such as a new MAC address being learned, causes the port to enter disabled state, effectively disabling it until manually enabled by an administrator. This is useful in high security or publicly accessible areas when strict enforcement is needed. A user can successfully ping internal servers and access shared file folders using hostname, but they are unable to reach any websites. You attempt to ping a public IP like 8.8.8.8 and the ping fails. DNS resolution works. Hostnames are converting to IP addresses, but the traffic doesn't reach the destination. Traceroute shows that traffic leaves the user's subnet but never reaches the internet. What is the most likely issue in this case?
three, two, one. NAC configuration missing or misapplied. If internal users can resolve DNS and reach internal servers but cannot access the internet or ping external IPs, the likely culprit is missing or incorrect. NAT address translation configuration. NAT is essential for translating internal private IPs into public IPs that can be a traverse across the network. I'm on the Popple Squad gang. All right, let's see what the next question is. An IoT sensor device connected to a switch is experiencing a random disconnection during high network activity. Upon investigation, you find that the device is connected to a port shared with other devices on the VLAN with frequent broadcast traffic. The device vendor recommends isolating it from high volumes or broadcast and multicast traffic. What switch configuration should you implement? Three, two, one. Configure storm control on the port. Storm control allows you to set thresholds for broadcast, multicast, and unknown unicast traffic on a switch port. This protects low powered or sensitive devices like IoT sensors from being overwhelmed during traffic bursts or broadcast storms. Port fast use or accelerate STP convergence but won't limit traffic. BPDU guard prevents malicious STP participation but doesn't affect broadcast level and port security limits MAC addresses, not actual traffic volume. A technician is troubleshooting a network issue where a switch port connected to a VoIP phone is dropping connectivity intermittently. The phone shares the port with a user's PC through a built-in switch. The technician confirms the switch port is configured as an access port for VLAN 20 which is the data VLAN. However, the VoIP phone is configured to tag its voice traffic for VLAN 10. The user reports that their PC works fine, but the phone loses registration randomly. What change should the technician make to support both devices properly? Three, two, one. Configure voice VLAN 10 on the port. Cisco switches support a special configuration called a voice VLAN, allowing VoIP phones to tag voice traffic separately from untagged PC data traffic. This enables both the phone and the PC to operate on different VLANs through the same physical port. The switch port should remain in access mode for the data VLAN while voice traffic is tagged using a voice VLAN setting. Tracking is unnecessary and may introduce complexity for different endpoints. A router has multiple interfaces and one of them is configured with IP address DHCP. After rebooting the router, that interface fails to obtain an IP address. The connected switch port is in access mode and configure for VLAN 30, which is known to support DHCP. The DHCP server is online and reachable from other devices on VLAN 30. You verify with show IP interface brief that the interface is in the administratively down state. What is the most likely reason the interface is not receiving an IP address? Just another quick tip, make sure that you're paying attention to that type of stuff. Uh, make sure that you're paying attention to most likely, least likely, most expensive, least expensive, so on and so forth. Three, two, one. What's the most likely reason? 
So most likely uh, somebody uh, manually did that, right? So the interface is administratively shut down. If the interface is administratively down, it means that it has been manually disabled using the shutdown command. In this state, the interface cannot send or receive traffic, including DHCP requests. The traffic, or excuse me, the correct action is to enable it with the no shutdown command. So I think this is an awesome time, awesome spot to talk about um, the actual sponsor of this training, which is Master IT and the Zero to IT Pro and the Zero to IT Hero program. If you are interested in getting the certification that can actually get you a job, certification that actually matter in as little as 90 days, you can get four certifications in as little as 90 days, 100% online in the Zero to IT Pro program. The link to that is in the description. Second announcement is the Zero to IT Hero program is going to have our next cohort in the end of September. I'm super excited about it. Um, we're going to be limiting the class to 20 people, right? And the requirement is you have to be in the pro program and pass ITF Plus before you can even be considered for the HERO program. Last but not least, we have a beginner program. If you think all of that stuff is a little bit too advanced, you're trying to just dip your toe in the water, we have pretty much something for everybody, right? And on top of that, we have the practice test questions. So pretty much we can help you if you need a little help or if you need a lot of help, right? A lot of help would be the HERO program where we help you get the skills, the certs, and help you actually get a job. So if um, you're looking to really change your life, uh, make sure that you start with the pro, and then in September, we can get you into the HERO.